So I am a marine biologist by education and my expertise is in fish nutrition, fish and crustacean nutrition. And I happen to meet uh, Shekhar and his lovely wife, Murata, uh, 32 years ago in Israel, where they were very surprised to see that the amount of rain that we get in Israel, the annual amount of rain, is equivalent to one day of rain, heavy rain, monsoon rain in your part of the world. So we have to do our maximum to conserve our water and to use the water wisely. Now to answer your question, about 25 years ago, I was approached by uh, the farmers here in Israel who grow koi carp. This is ornamental carp. And one of the problems that they raised was the fact that these are ornamental carp. People would like to come, see them, enjoy them. And if you have them in a pond and the pond is covered with filamentous algae or with water hyacinth on top, the people cannot see these beautiful fish. Now you must remember that these fish are very valuable and each fish is sold for an enormous amount of money. In fact, some of these fish can be sold for 100 or 200 lakh per fish. So this is very, very valuable. So they wanted to know what would be the effect of glyphosate and other herbicides on these fish if they spray them on the water in order to kill the filamentous algae. Of course, I was not going to do experiments with these expensive fish. We did experiments with fish from the same family, the uh, carp family. Uh, you in India have a number of species of these carps. We have mainly the uh, Cyprinus carpio, which is the main one in Israel. And we also have, of course, koi carp. Uh, you have uh, other species like rojo, katla, and other species of the same family. So I decided to test this in different dosages uh, in the water to see the effect. I was very happy to see that the effect on the filamentous algae was uh, tremendous, even when using the low dose that is recommended for land use of, uh, of the glyphosate. And of course, we went up to higher and higher levels and did not see any adverse effect on the fish, not at the time when we applied and not later to see later effects, of course, when we are talking about koi carp, which are so valuable, we do not want to be in a situation where we don't see anything immediately after application, but at a later stage, the fish develop uh, growths or problems of that sort. So we checked, we kept the fish going for two and three years after the application and found no adversive uh, effects on it. So that brings me back to uh, when I teach at university or even when I give popular lectures, I ask people what do they think of uh, genetically modified organisms, GMOs. And of course, most people are against GMOs. And I say, what happens if you will eat a plant that has a GMO in it, or is it, it's a GMO plant. And they say, no, we won't eat it because it's dangerous, it's problematic, etc." And I say, well, I'm sorry to tell you, but each and every one of you has been consuming GMO plants. So they say, how can it be? I said, because 85% of the soya bean in the world is GMO. The next question I ask is, do you know why, what is the GMO in this plant? What has been changed here? So most people say it's been more resistant to diseases or to drought or to things of that sort. And I say, no, the GMO soybean, which is sold all over the world, 
is GMO with resistance to glyphosate. That's all. And why is that so important? Because when you sow the soybean, later on, you can spray with glyphosate, all the weeds will perish and your soybean will grow because it's resistant to glyphosate. So these are the good and the bad uh, effects that exist. And uh, if I look at the whole picture, as we've heard before from Dr. Parag, gave a very important view of the whole system, we can say for sure that of the chemicals that we know, and there are many chemicals, this is one of the safest to be used even in water uh, bodies, because uh, even though the water body is very deep, the concentration used is the same as for land surface. That is, although we calculate it as for land safe surface, the body of water contains in many instances, many meters of water below the surface. So the effect that reaches the bottom of the water body is of course much less than at the top layer. Therefore, I think that it is a good solution for getting rid of some of these weeds, which are a true menace, and the effect on the other animal kingdom, other population of animals, wildlife, in my opinion, is minimal. I uh, was listening to what my colleague said, and I was also reading the chat. And uh, I would like to comment about some of the questions that have come up there. First of all, I want to reassure you that I do not work for a chemical company or a company that manufactures glycosate, and I'm not their agent, <laughs> and I don't intend to uh, sound like a salesman for them. My uh, opinions are based on my experience over the last 25 years. That's a long period of time. Uh, someone mentioned here that DDT was considered wonderful until people found out that it's terrible for the environment and for people. I agree that DDT is certainly a detrimental chemical. One of the problems is that DDT's half lifetime is 90 years. That means that if we want to see all of it disappearing, it will take more than 200 years. And uh, that of course is something that we do not want to put in the environment and glyphosate does not have uh, the half lifetime of 90 years. In addition to that, it's been used extensively on land and water. And to date, the number of uh, scientific articles that show some type of a problem are only a handful. So that does say something about this chemical. And also we must always remember that you have to maintain safe quantities. That is follow the instructions of the uh, people who have tested this and know exactly what is your limit. Obviously, if you give a lot more than what is needed, you will cause harm. That goes for medication as well. It's lovely to have one aspirin tablet can help you. But if you take a hundred tablets, it for sure will harm you. So we have to see in the articles what was done exactly, how much was applied, at what concentrations, to what need, over what surface, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I don't say that everything is wonderful, but we should very carefully check what was done in each of these experiments, both in those that showed good results and those that showed some detrimental results. That is my comment to some of the people who have mentioned here different other chemicals. And of course, the fact that people are using pesticides at enormous quantities does not in any way mean 
that uh, using glyphosate is, is nothing compared to that. That's not the argument. The argument is, does it harm the environment? And if so, to what extent? Now, I read one comment that glyphosate might uh, have an effect on the bacteria in the gut of some uh, animals or fish. I have studied the microbiome of fish, and there are many, many chemicals, and not only chemicals, different foods affect the microbiome in different ways. So it's very difficult to pinpoint and to say glyphosate did this, and as a result, the fish uh, died or was harmed by the exposure to glyphosate. In saying so, I don't mean that this does not have to be checked and has to be checked very carefully. One more comment to one of the people. They asked, who funded my uh, tests and my experiments? Well, I worked for the government of Israel and the government of Israel funded this, uh, uh, these tests. And of course, I don't think that any of you have in mind that the government of Israel owns a factory that manufactures glyphosate. So uh, the results that we have are based on our experiments, which were not funded by a chemical company. And therefore, I think that they are more reliable than some of the results that might be coming out from different chemical companies. I hope that I've shed some light on the questions that people have. Thank you, Dr. Parag, and all the participants for your valuable comments. I think that uh, this webinar is very important in order to air out some of the thoughts and problems and questions that people have. And we can see that the, uh, the problems are there, the solutions are not that easy, but um, I think that by addressing these questions and answering to the best of our knowledge and ability, we, I think, were able to uh, at least have people air out their thoughts and think in a different manner about the same problems. And for that, I think that this webinar was very important. And once again, I thank all the participants and wish you good luck in your good work.